main reason why we restarted this this paper is because at that time there was a huge surge of interest in this gender approach uh, of migration and uh, there are more and more papers on how migration brings about associate, um, well, changes in the society, in the, in the fabric of a society in the origin countries. Uh, and then there's also this uh, strand of literature that looks at women left behind and their role in, the, in what has been, been called the migration development nexus. So we try to look a bit um, at what happens, uh, especially when, when the, um, the female relatives of, of migrants are within a household, and we try to see what are the, the impacts on, on these, these female relatives, not only the wives, because most of the literature is focused on the wives. So we, we try to, to look a bit broader than this. Because uh, most of the papers, they, and this, this was also our hypothesis, is that the male migration can bring about um, a sort of empowerment for women. Uh, it has been seen a bit in the case of Egypt and of Jordan, and we wanted also to test it in, in the case of Morocco. There's then this growing external literature on the impact of migration and also what, uh, on the impact of migra migration separate from that of, of remittances on, um, on the family members left behind. Uh, so this is our, our, our main question of, of research is how does immigration and remittances separately will impact female activity rates in Morocco and then whether there are any implications in terms of, of empowerment. Uh, we therefore will test uh, the validity of the hypothesis in the case of, of Morocco, because there is very little research on Morocco, mainly due to a lack of data. The, the research uh, that, that there is, it's mostly qualitative, and I'll come to that in, in a short while. And then another question that came out is actually, what drives women labor market participation in Morocco? So we should try, also try to look a bit in what are the factors that push women to go on the labor market in, in, in Morocco? And then, uh, in order to better understand uh, the mechanisms, we use uh, with quantitative and qualitative approach. Now, for a little bit of literature, so most of the literature is around the, the various channels. So the first channel through which we expect migration to have an impact on uh, women's la uh, labor market participation is through a labor substitution effect of migration with uh, men or individual leaving one region uh, therefore, it creates um, a decrease in the supply of labor force, and we might expect that labor participation of individuals left behind would increase in order to compensate for those that have left the, the region. Um, then uh, you also have the studies on the impact of remittances, mainly on reservation wage, that show that once when a household receives remittances, their reservation wage might go up in the sense that they can prefer not to go on the labor market since they already have a source of, of income. Although it has been shown that this can also uh, increase, for instance, the time spent in education. It's not just, the, the substitution is not just about uh, leisure. But then in the case of mostly of rural areas, it has been shown that remittances can lift the budget constraints and therefore families that uh, which receive remittances can use this extra money in order to hire uh, agricultural workers, for instance, and then themselves they can withdraw from, from the labor market. Nevertheless, we know that uh, in the MENA region, uh, the labor um, division, it's very gendered. Uh, we rarely see, especially in the, in the rural areas, uh, women that can go in, uh, on the labor market to take over the, um, the extra labor demand that the men have left behind. If male immigrate, it's really the case that the women will go to, to replace them on the labor market. And then what we also have, and especially in the case of Morocco, are very 
resilient cultural norms. And these cultural norms, they act towards lowering women labor, women's labor market participation because the traditional um, so, so val uh, values in the Middle East and North African region are for women to stay at home, uh, not go out that much, and while well, going on the labor market has an implication on women actually going out of the house. So we don't know exactly what would be the effect of migration on uh, labor market participation. A few things on the Moroccan context. So, uh, as you might know, uh, international migration from Morocco is very important. Uh, it's mainly directed towards uh, Europe, and most of it comes from um, from the rural areas. So uh, we have a the, we have tried to look a bit uh, at the impact of migration on. Um, on poverty rates, so I'll just come to, to that. Uh, Heine Haas has shown that between 20 and 50 percent of households in the Rift Mountains have at least one migrant, so it's a phenomenon that touches upon a very large share of the, of the society in, uh, in Morocco, and it's, it has been shown that uh, remittances have a strong impact on uh, the living standards of households. And so the Antetor had, had computed that without remittances, the poverty would, would go up by more than, than four percentage point. Then about women in the labor market in Morocco. So Morocco, a bit like the other countries in the MENA region, has a very low uh, female economic activity. It had gone up from uh, 1971 until 2007 from 12 percent to a bit more than 27%, but still very low uh, female labor uh, market participation, especially given uh, the high increase that Morocco experienced in terms of education of, of women. Uh, this, this increase in, uh, in the level of education of women was also accompanied by the decrease in the age of marriage. So we might have expected that uh, the labor market would increase, and we didn't, uh, we didn't see that, that increase. Also, in terms of what women do when they are actively employed, uh, we saw that they are mainly unpaid family workers. So these, this is mainly in rural areas. Uh, in rural areas, their activity rate uh, it's a bit, a bit lower, but still, they are mainly out in the fields, they do animal husbandry, they, um, they work the crops, uh, but these are very uh, low skilled and uh, very bad, well, the conditions are very bad for women in general when they, they do work. And then uh, there was also a study uh, by, by Blary who shows that the social cultural factors are very important in explaining these very low levels of, of participation. Now, what do we do in the study? So, this is easier. So, we use an explanatory mixed methods approach following uh, Cressel and, and Plano Clark, and we, we use in depth interviews and also. Uh, survey that uh, quantitative data, so the quantitative data. It's the 2006 and 2007 uh, Morocco Living Standard Measurements. Uh, as I, I mentioned, the data is something very delicate to get uh, in Morocco. The, um, planning com the High Planning Commission is the one that runs all the surveys, but the, the access to the data is very limited. So uh, we managed to, to get this, this data set from one of the directors, but it's, it was an exception, so we're very happy uh, that, that we could get it in order to test a bit uh, at the national level what, uh, what are the impacts. And in this survey, there are around uh, 7,000 uh, 7, households and 36,000 individuals, and among them we have uh, approximately 12,000 women, which are between 15 and 60 years old, so we can look at, at the activity rates. And then the quality of data um, consists of 12 in-depth interviews conducted with women which are living in households with uh, international migrants. They, are, uh, they have been run in 
the rural area uh, in the Togba, uh, Togba Valley in southern Morocco. So just a few very quick uh, numbers in order to give you a bit of an idea of um, the Moroccan households. So we have divided them in three types. Households which do not have international migrants, nor do they receive remittances. Households which have international migrants, but no remittances. And households which have international migrants and receive remittances. Uh, you can see that 11% um, of, the, of, the, um, of the sample of the survey are ma is made of households which have both international migrants and remittances. And um, also that these households are, um, are rich, well, they have a uh, higher expenditure compared to that of households without migrant and, and remittance. However, we have also a difference with the households which have migrants but don't receive remittances. Uh, these last households, they are also slightly different in terms of the number of uh, household members which are, which are employed. They have a higher, uh, slightly higher uh, number of, of um, members which are employed. And what's uh, more interesting also to look at is the percentage of the household that have a production unit, because we would have expected to see a difference. And what we actually see is that the percentage is slightly lower for, for the households uh, with migrants but no remittances, but finally there is not a big difference. Uh, if we look at women in these three types of households, okay, so the, these are on the, on the women between uh, 15 and 60 years old. And on the first column, you have the means for the women in the type 1 household. And in this, the other two columns, you have the differences compared to this first column. And it indicates whether it's significant or not. And you see that women's profiles are very different uh, in the households which are exposed to international migration. They are less likely to be in rural areas. They are more educated. and. Also, in terms of household composition, you can see that for uh, women living in households with uh, migrants but without remittances have a higher probability of living with their parents-in-law. And of course, this might have an impact afterwards on their labor market participation. Um, in terms of labor market outcomes, uh, we can see here that the labor market participation is also very different and that it's significantly lower for women which live in households exposed to international migration with or without remittances. So the model that, that we, we estimated, it's also due to the, inter to the qualitative data that we, we constructed the, the model as you will see it. So it's a very first model of the determinants of the labor market participation in which we distinguish between uh, the probability of having a migrant and the, and the remittances that the household receives. Oh, sorry. And then we will uh, we'll estimate different models because we observe some effects on the labor market participation, but with the, with the, uh, with the um, in-depth interviews, we realized that the picture is way more complicated than just looking at labor market participation. So then we'll also be estimating the probability of being an unpaid family worker and also the probability of having an income generating activity. Uh, since both migration and remittances uh, are endogenous, we will have an instrumental approach we instrument migration using the historical regional intensity of migration that was provided to us by the Geographic and, and Historical Institute of Morocco. And uh, for remittances, we finally end up using the remittance norm at the village level. We had initially constructed the database with all the remittance uh, points, so all the MoneyGram and Western Union and Post points all over Morocco. Uh, it didn't work as an instrument, but if anyone's interested, we do have it. Uh, and so we end up using the disremittance norm. Now, you can't see here very well, but this is going to make it a bit better. What you see here is uh, the estimation. So the second column is the, f um, 
is the model with the, the instruments. And what we find is that having an international migrant, <laughs> in <laughs> thank you, Nick, <laughs> uh, increases the probability of women going on the labor market. So it increases women's labor market participation. However, receiving remittances decreases women's labor market participation. What, um, so I will come back to the other uh, results, but what I wanted to show you first are the results by different labor market outcomes, because for us, this was somehow a puzzling result. So what we do see is that when we look at unpaid family workers, we find this effect, uh, this positive effect of migration. So we have find the labor compensation effect. However, with remittances, we find again this negative effect. What I, I will also, I can also come back to that, but what it actually means is that in rural areas, women prefer to withdraw from the labor market when they receive remittances because, well, they, they are mostly out in the field, in the sun, and, um, and doing a very inconvenient work. Whereas, neither having uh, an international migrant nor remittances have an effect on income generating activities. Given that we know that the, um, the probability of having an income generating activity is the main determinant of women empowerment, we can therefore see that, well, expect that migration will not have an impact on, um, on women's empowerment in Morocco through the labor market. Now, another interesting graphic I wanted to, to show you is uh, that of um, the marital status, because up here, we can uh, also see that being married lowers uh, women's labor market participation. Just we have it here. Also, living with the, with the parents-in-law lowers la women's labor market participation. So what we did is simply um, uh, plotted the activity rate compared to age, have there, and then the red line is actually the, uh, the mean age at the time of marriage. And what we do see is that the, pro the activity rate increases until the, the average age at the time of marriage and then decreases afterwards. Then we also ran some uh, robustness checks. First of all, because we do have, have some uh, potentially endogenous controls, and the other uh, issue that uh, we stumbled upon is the case of the households which had migrants but didn't receive remittances because as you remember their profile is it's slightly different from the others. So for the first uh, problem for the potentially endogenous control we ran the correlations between the variables of interest and the variables we consider to be uh, potentially endogenous uh, mainly the consumption expenditure, whether the household has an internal migrant, the number of children under the age, the age of six, and whether the household has uh, livestock. And the coefficients that we got are, are rather low, so we think that that's not going to be a problem, and then we also ran the regression with and without the exogenous um, controls, and our results are rather consistent, are consistent with, with the initial ones. And then for the second one, we had thought that what, what could these, um, these households be? So the first uh, idea that we got is that maybe these households, which have international migration but do not receive remittances, are households which have international students abroad. Uh, because uh, it's, these are the ones that seemed more likely to, to be in this case. So we withdraw from the sample uh, the um, households which had uh, students, for which the migrants had been abroad for studies, and again, we have, um, we have the same results as before. And uh, just a few of our case study findings, uh, which we couldn't see exactly in the data, and here's also where uh, we see, we've seen how complementary the, the two databases were. First of all, the channels at play that we couldn't uh, gra grasp uh, with the data 
are those of, of social pressure, first of all, because uh, men uh, are expected to send remittances in order to have their, to, in order for their women, for their wives to be able to stay at home. And this is something we, we have often seen in the interviews. In general, when a woman has to go to work, this is interpret, interpreted as the lack of, of the husband's ability to provide for her. So she needs to go on the labor market. Um, also, uh, we, we've also um, had women that's, uh, that told us that uh, whenever they, they, they received remittances, that allowed them to hire women from households which only had internal migrants in order to help them out with the workload. Um, and I'm going to finish really fast with, with these two because this, they didn't appear in the, in, the, in the quantitative data. First of all, the importance of who is the remittance receiver. And this is something we see throughout the literature. And it's also something that you, you've shown in your, in your project because in general, women said that when they ask um, the remittance receiver for money, in this case, uh, it's a brother-in-law, but it can also be the parents-in-law, they would say no. So they would be uh, deprived of an direct access to the remittances, which could also be expected to have an empowering role. And then, Again, we found this, this idea of the importance of the income generating activities for, for women in status because several women had said that they would like to work just to have their own money and therefore feel more empowered, be able to do whatever they, they want with, with their money. Really fast on the concluding remarks, so we find a labor supply compensation effect of migration. Uh, however, when we look at unpaid family, um, family <coughs> worker, this effect is stronger because we think that this is a labor supply driven effect, which is the one which is impacted by migration, where, whereas the income generating activity, which is a labor demand driven mechanism, is not impacted by migration. And therefore, uh, we think that international migration is unlikely to play a role in women's empowerment in Morocco because the labor market conditions are so bad that women prefer not to go on the, on the labor market. And I finished. Thank you.